Dedicated to my wife, Charlotte Nichols. Ronald McNair. Dr. Ronald McNair died when the space shuttle Challenger blew up in January 1986. He and his fellow astronauts, including the first civilian astronaut, teacher Krista McAuliffe, will always be remembered as heroes who helped to conquer space. While perhaps no is worth the loss of young and vital people, it is fitting that the astronauts who died in the Challenger were such a mixed group. There were two women, one Asian American and one African American, in addition to three white men. All were serving a country that prides itself on giving equal opportunity to everyone, regardless of race or sex. Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, and Krista McAuliffe all chose to take advantage of that opportunity. Ronald McNair, being black, had to work the hardest. Ronald Irwin McNair was born October 21, 1950, in Lake City, South Carolina. His mother, Pearl, was a school teacher in the black schools, which were separate from and not equal to the white schools. His father, Carl, was an automobile mechanic who had not completed high school. Carl McNair deeply regretted not having finished school, and he insisted that his three sons get the education he had not received. Ronald was the second of three boys. His older brother was named Carl Jr., the younger, Eric. They lived in a big, old, weather-beaten, unpainted wooden house on Moore Street in Lake City. It belonged to Carl McNair's family. Ronald's grandfather had been a bishop in the Church of God movement, and there was a church in the yard. By the time Ronald was born, Bishop McNair had died, but the church was still active. Ron and his family shared the house with his grandmother, great-grandmother, and assorted aunts and uncles and cousins. Everyone worked hard to help out the family, and even the little children were had chores to do as soon as they were able. Ron's great-grandmother took care of the young children before they entered school. She had be began teaching them to read right away. She herself could not write, so they had to wait until school started to learn that. By the time he was three years old, Ron was reading some words, and by the time he was four, his family felt he was ready for school. The Lake City schools would not take such a young child, so the family took him to the principal of Cameron Town Elementary School in nearby countryside. He attended school at Cameron Town with older rural children until he was five and eligible to enroll at the black school nearest his home in Lake City. There, his teacher, Mrs. Jones, was struck by how serious he was. He always had a pencil behind his ear and a notebook in his hand. She saw him as a bright loner who would go out of his way, go out to the playground with his class, lie on the ground, stare up into the sky, and smile. He did well in school and, in fact, was always ahead of his classmates in the work the class was doing. But he did not become bored. He could always read ahead in the textbook. Science was his favorite subject. He carried a slide rule around in his back pocket. His classmates named him Gil, which is a slang term for a machine part. When the Soviet Union launched the first space vehicle, Sputnik, in 1957, Seven-year-old Ron was so excited that, according to an elementary school classmate, he walked around saying, Sputnik, 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 all the time. Music was a close second to science as Ron's favorite subject. In the beginning of his seventh grade year, he started taking band, and it was typical of the way he applied himself that by Christmas he was playing saxophone in the marching band. Learning did not stop when school was over. At home, Ron and his brothers were expected to read. His parents bought them the World Book Encyclopedia, and the boys spent Saturday mornings reading from A through Z. In the summers and during school vacations, Ron and his brothers worked in the nearby cotton fields. It was hard, back-breaking work, but they did not complain. Later on, Ron said, I gained qualities in that cotton field. I got tough. I learned to endure. 
I refused to quit. In many ways, Lake City was still the Old South, where most blacks worked in the cotton and tobacco fields and lived in poverty. Schools, libraries, drinking fountains, and buses were segregated. Few blacks were allowed to register to vote. The Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s took a long time to come to Lake City, and the Ku Klux Klan was active there well into the 1960s. When Ron was a boy, Klan members would ride around at night and fire their guns into homes of blacks who were working for equal rights, especially the right to vote. Ron's family was never attacked, but they were fearful of the Klan. When the children asked why the Klan hated black people and why there were, was segregation, the elder McNairs would only could assure them that they were as good as anyone else and could be anything they wanted. But it was difficult living under those conditions. When Ron was ten, his father left the family to live in the north. Carl McNair moved to East Harlem in New York City, but he returned to Lake City every summer and sometimes at holidays. He participated with his wife in major decisions affecting the family and was available when his sons needed him. In the summers, Carl McNair coached the local boys' baseball teams. Ron was always on them. He was not only good at his classwork, he was also an excellent athlete. In fact, he excelled at whatever he tried. At Carver High School, he named, was named after the black scientist George Washington Carver. He was on the basketball, baseball, and football teams and also played saxophone in the school band. He won awards in physics and a science fair award for a rocket project. When he graduated, he was valedictorian of the senior class. There was no question that he would go to college as his older brother Carl Jr. had before him. One of his aunts helped him to get a scholarship to North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College in Greensboro, where Carl Jr. was enrolled. Established in 1891 as the Agricultural and Mechanical College for the Colored Race, the school had educated generations of black students who were barred from white colleges. North Carolina A&T also had a proud recent tradition. In 1960, some of its black students had staged sit-ins at the local Woolworths lunch counter and sparked a student sit-in movement against segregation across the South. By the time Ronald McNair entered the North Carolina A&T, white colleges were no longer segregated, but many black students felt more comfortable attending a black college. McNair wasn't sure if he was good enough to major in physics, which is what he secretly wanted to do. He finally sought the help of a guidance counselor at the school who gave him a group of tests. Based on the results of those tests, the counselor recommended that McNair major in science. You're good enough, she said, and Ron took her advice. He kept his interest in music and played his saxophone in a student and blues band that played at campus clubs and dances at local high schools. He also took up karate in his spare time and came to love the discipline and grace of it. He took classes at the YMCA until he won his black belt. Then he started his own karate club at the college. North Carolina A&T had just reorganized its physics department when McNair chose to major in science and he became one of the department's star pupils. He spent part of one semester in an exchange program at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT in Cambridge, one of the best science schools in the nation. Coming from an all-black school in one to one that was mostly white was a big change for him, but his family had instilled in him a great pride in himself, and he did not feel awkward. He recognized the MIT of courses he wanted to take, and he determined to go there after he graduated from North Carolina A&T. By taking a heavy course load, McNair managed to graduate early. In fact, he and his older brother Carl were in the same graduating class. It was a proud move moment for the McNair family, for the two brothers were the first men in the family to graduate from college. There were other proud McNair graduates that June. Ron's and Carl's brother, Eric, graduated from high school. So did, the grandmother. so did their grandmother, Mabel Montgomery, who received her high school diploma at the age of 
65. The following September, Ron entered the doctoral program in physics at MIT. His tuition and fees were paid for by a Ford Foundation scholarship for black graduate students. At MIT, he soon realized that he was not as well prepared academically as many of his, many of his fellow students, even though he graduated with high honors from North Carolina A&T. But he determined to catch up by ex working extra hard. He was fortunate to have Michael Field as his advisor. The two became close friends. McNair taught Feld karate. Feld taught McNair physics. He encouraged McNair to do extra study in the field. McNair's special field of study was laser physics. Laser standing for light amplification by simulated emission of radiation. It uses atoms to generate electromagnetic waves in the visible part of the spectrum. To earn his doctorate, McNair had to write a dissertation and he spent nearly two years doing experiments and collecting data for it. Then a flood destroyed all his notes, but he spent only a short time worrying about the loss. Soon he was back in the laboratory redoing the experiments. In three or four months, he had compiled all the data again. That's what kind of student he was, said Feld. He was able to bring all his skills, his perseverance, resourcefulness, intelligence, good hands in the lab, and the ability to work intensively to bear on scientific problem to get the job done. While he was work on his dissertation, Ron met Cheryl Moore at services at St. Paul's Church. Cheryl was a teacher in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and the two were immediately attracted to one another. They married soon afterward in the same church where they had met. McNair earned his doctorate from MIT in 1976. Mm -hmm. Around the same time, they, he received a flyer about the space shuttle program. Becoming an astronaut seemed the perfect next step in his career. He had always been interested in space from the time as a first grader when he would lie on the playground and look up into the sky and smile. In high school, McNair had won a prize in science fair for a rocket project. His specialty, laser physics, was a field that had many applications to the astronaut and shuttle programs. He was aware that there were no blacks in the astronaut program, but as he said some years later, I figured if they were sincere about the qualifications, I had a good chance at it. He applied to the program. The U.S. space program had begun in 1958 after the 1957 launch of the Soviet Union's Sputnik 1 Sputnik 1, an unmanned space capsule, managed to achieve orbit and orbited Earth for 184 days. Americans did not want Russians to conquer space first, and when he was elected in 1960, mm -hmm. President John F. Kennedy made the space program a major goal. The following year, Commander Alan Shepard became the first American in space when he took a 15-minute ride on Freedom 7, America's first space vehicle. Freedom 7 went up into the air and then came right back down again, but it was a start. But it was a start. At first, all the astronauts in the NASA program were white, and there was discrimination in the program. President Kennedy appointed the first black astronaut to the program in 1962. Captain Edward Dwight, a pilot in the Air Force, was in the program for four years. The Air Force claimed that he failed to complete his training, but Dwight later said that he quit under pressure. They didn't want black involvement. They felt that to spend, send blacks into space would lessen the general public's enthusiasm for the space program. After President Kennedy was assassinated, Vice President Lyndon Johnson became president. He appointed the second black, he appointed the second black astronaut, Bob Lawrence. But Lawrence died in a plane crash soon afterward. No other blacks were in the NASA program for about 10 years. By the middle 1970s, NASA was under pressure to include blacks in its programs. And the agency responded to that pressure by starting a drive to recruit minorities. They hired Nichelle Nicholas, who had starred as Uhuru in the popular TV series Star Trek. 
to do advertisements and give speeches at black schools and to community groups. They sent flyers to the science departments of black colleges as well as white colleges like MIT. They made efforts to ensure that black candidates had more had equal opportunity to apply to the program as white candidates, but whoever was chosen had to pass the same scrutiny. While he was waiting to hear from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, Ron and Cheryl McNair moved to Los Angeles, where he had accepted a job as a staff physicist at the Hughes Research Laboratories. He worked there until January 1978, when he learned he had been selected as an astronaut. When Ronald McNair entered the NASA program, two other blacks were also admitted to the 78-member group of astronauts. The others were Guyon Bluford and Charles Bolden. There were also women, including Sally Ride, who would later become the first American woman in space. The McNairs moved to Houston to be near the headquarters of the Johnson Space Center. While there were many churches in the area, they chose to attend Antioch Baptist Church, a 90-minute drive away. Not only did McNair attend that church on Sunday, he also drove there two other times every week to teach karate to local youngsters. The McNairs' first child, Reginald Irvin, was born in Houston and baptized Baptist Church. By the time Ronald McNair entered the NASA program, America's interest in space had changed. In the beginning, the push was toward manned space flights and exploration and on surpassing the Soviet Union's accomplishments. On June 20, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin made, the, made American proud by becoming the first human beings to land on the moon. In the early 1970s, the United States continued manned exploration with Skylab, an Earth-orbiting space station. Skylab was launched by an unmanned booster rocket. The crews arrived later in another craft that docked to the main capsule. After 1972, however, technology had been developed that allowed unmanned craft to explore space. The Mariner and Viking program studied Venus and Mars. The Pioneer program studied the outer planets and more distant space. Each program resulted in more knowledge of the solar system and beyond. By the mid-1970s, Americans were no longer as interested in space exploration for its own sake. Sending rockets into space, whether manned or unmanned, cost a lot of money. The national feeling was that the space program ought to start paying for itself by building reusable spacecraft that could have a commercial purpose. The space shuttle program was developed to meet this demand. NASA started to build the space shuttle in 1972. It is part rocket because it is propelled by rockets. It is part spacecraft because it can navigate in outer space. And it is part airplane because it has delta wings and can glide on air currents. The shuttle is capable of carrying payloads such as weather, and communication satellites that government and private corporations are willing to pay to have launched. The shuttle can do work in space, such as build space stations. Shuttle astronauts can also perform tasks in space, such as conducting scientific experiments requested by government and private corporations. When McNair joined the astronaut program, NASA was getting ready to launch the first space shuttle and wanted to train shuttle astronauts. All the new astronaut candidates went through the same basic training. For six months, they attended classes in geology, medicine, aerodynamics, communications, astronomy, and shuttle systems. Then they visited all the different NASA space centers. Kennedy at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Marshall Space Center Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where shuttle engines were developed and Rockwell Aircraft Company in California, where the shuttles were built. Finally, in Houston and at Johnson Space Flight Center, they spent three months working on different aspects of the shuttle program, such as the mechanical arm that is used to move payloads in and out of the spacecraft's cargo bay and on different experiments in the Space Lab program. After a year of training, the astronaut candidates became full-fledged astronauts, the first shuttle launching was still two years away, so all went to work 
in the shuttle program while they continued to train for the time when they would actually fly in the shuttle. Some trained as shuttle pilots, others as mission specialists. The pilots flew the shuttle. The mission specialists were experts in the various types of cargo the shuttles would carry and train to conduct experiments, operate the mechanical arm, launch satellites, and do all the other things the shuttle was up in space to do. Ronald McNair trained as a mission specialist. All of the astronauts spent time both in Houston and at the Johnson Space and Rockwell Aircraft Company flying in shuttle simulators, which were machines that Im imitated the look and feel of the shuttle. In these shuttle simulators, they learned how it would feel to be flying in the shuttle and how to navigate it, but they all looked forward to the day when they would be able to fly in the real thing. Columbia, the first space shuttle, was launched in April 1981. It made its fourth flight on July 4, 1982. By, the time, by this time, Challenger, America's second shuttle, was ready for testing. It made its first flight in May 1983. Sally Ride became the first American woman in space when she was part of its second flight in June 1983. On its third mission, two months later, Challenger carried the first black American into space. Guyan Bluford. Because it was a historic moment, many famous blacks went to Cape Canaveral, Florida to watch that Challenger launch. Comedian Bill Cosby, former basketball star Wilt Chamberlain, and Dr. James Cheek, the president of Howard University, were among them. Ronald McNair was just as proud of Guy Bluford as the others. He understood that one of the three black astronauts had to be first. He was just looking forward to the time when his turn would come. His turn came the following year in February 1984 when he flew as a mission specialist above aboard Challenger. His job was to conduct 17 different experiments, ranging from making new alloys to harnessing solar energy to pinpointing weather and agricultural predictions. He also assisted in the launching of a 75 million communication satellite from the Challenger's cargo bay. When he learned that he had been selected for the Challenger mission, McNair decided to have some fun while he was at it. Once in orbit, he put on a black beret and dark glasses and brought out a movie clapperboard, the kind on which directors record the particular scene they are filming. His name badge read Cecil B. McNair, a takeoff from, from the name Cecil B. DeMille, a famous movie director and producer. He brought his old North Carolina a and banner with him and displayed it on one of the walls in the crew's quarters. This was to show the world how proud he was of the black college where he had studied for his undergraduate degree. Once on the shuttle, Mission Control back on the ground woke him up one morning by playing the school song. On that mission, Challenger orbited the Earth a total of 122 times, and McNair enjoyed every orbit. He joked about being able to see his hometown of Lake City from space. He was intrigued by the weightlessness in space and decided that the biggest problem here was moving without being clumsy. He learned that sitting or lying down took so much energy that it was simpler just to keep standing when he ate or slept. Even turning a dial too hard would start him revolving in a circle. When the mission was over, Ronald McNair had many chances to tell about his experience. He spent a week in New York making public appearances and visiting with his proud father. He addressed the Massachusetts and South Carolina legislatures. Wherever he was invited to give a speech, he asked if his hosts could also arrange for him to speak at a local public school. It was very important for McNair to talk to young people. He wanted them to believe that they could succeed just as he had. As he told the graduating class at the University of South Carolina that June, you're better than good enough. You may not come from a well-to-do financial background. You may not come from an affluent social background. You may not come, you may not have glided through the University of South Carolina with the greatest of ease. But if you're willing to work hard, sacrifice, and struggle, then I proclaim today that you're better than good enough. 
McNair was already looking forward to his next shuttle flight. When asked about his plans for the future, he said he envisioned himself as a resident physicist on the space station for three months each year. In July 1984, his and Cheryl's daughter Joy was born, and after that, he started thinking about the future of his children. He wanted very much for them to grow up in South Carolina. His wife agreed with him. They weren't ready to make an abrupt move, but they decided to explore the possibilities. Meanwhile, McNair continued to work for NASA and was pleased to learn that he had been chosen for the Challenger mission scheduled for late January 1986. In December 1985, while on a visit to his hometown, McNair had a long meeting with the dean of the engineering school at the University of South Carolina. The two spoke three more times by telephone in January. They discussed McNair's joining the faculty of the university to teach physics. In McNair's mind, the upcoming shuttle flight would more than likely be his last. The January 28, 1986 Challenger flight was going to be a historic one. For one thing, seven people would, or were, would be aboard, the largest crew yet to fly a shuttle. For another, one of those people would be the first civilian in space, Christina McAuliffe. Christa McAuliffe, an elementary school teacher from Concord, New Hampshire. The crew would also include mission specialists Judith Resnick and Ellison Onizuka, payload specialist Greg Jarvis, pilot, pilot Mike Smith, and commander Francis Dick Scobie. On January 28, 1986, Ronald McNair's family sat in the special spectators section at Cape Canaveral with the families of the other astronauts. At T minus six seconds on a bright and chilly morning, the orbiter's main engines ignited and the 12 story tall shuttle rocketed into the air. Then, as it steadied, the shuttle's computers sent the command to two solid rocket boosters to give it the final thrust. Then, a minute later, a huge fireball raced the length of the spacecraft and a giant explosion consumed the shuttle and its crew. At first, no one on the ground could believe what had happened. The shuttle had vanished, leaving just a wisp of smoke. Then, as the reality of the tragedy settled in, people broke down and cried or were numb with shock. All seven people on board Challenger had disappeared with the craft. Months of investigation followed and the final conclusion was that the insulator tiles on the shuttle had become unstable in the chill of one of Florida's worst cold spells. They had not been effective in shielding the shuttle from the tremendous heat of the booster rockets. There was no need to investigate the effect of the tragedy on the nation and especially on the families of the men and women who had died. It would be years before the pain would subside. Ronald McNair's family thought about what he would like them to do in his memory and decided that he would want them to set up a school scholarship fund. He strongly believed that other young people who were poor should have a chance to go to school and study science, just as he had. So, less than a month after the Challenger tragedy, the McNair family announced the formation of the Ron McNair Scholarship Fund to help as many as 150 underprivileged students study science each year. Ron had a lot of hopes and dreams for young people, his family explained. We feel we would be remiss if we did not pick up the banner. That June, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology announced that it would name its new space center after Ronald McNair. The end.